welcome to this week's episode of the Cabin of Horrors podcast. Thank you so much for checking out the episode and the amount of support that the podcast has been getting, that Cabin of Horrors as a whole has been getting across all of our social media has just been so overwhelming. This past weekend on Twitch, we achieved something huge. We got our first hype train ever. And what that means is, is we got a whole bunch of subscribers, a whole bunch of bits and a whole bunch of gifted subscribers and things like that. Just people supporting. Cabin of Horror is huge, and we were able to achieve a hype train on Twitch, which was absolutely epic. It was so much fun, so I thank all of you who were there that night and supported and showed their love for Cabin of Horrors on Twitch. Thank you so much. If you haven't checked us out on Twitch, you can do so. You can go to twitch.tv slash Cabin of Horrors and check out all of our horror live streams. Usually we are on during the weekends, sometimes during the week. It just depends on life. But give us a follow and you'll always get a notification once we're live on Twitch. And this episode of the podcast is a really special one. This is our 13th episode of the podcast and is actually going to mark an end. This is going to be what is called season zero. As this podcast has been growing, I've been learning how to even be a fucking podcaster and all the stuff that goes into it and taking the feedback from all of you listeners and fans of Cabin who give me a whole bunch of ideas on where I should take the show and what kind of content I should give you guys going forward. So because of that, we've got a whole bunch of new stuff coming for what we're going to then call season one. This was season zero of the podcast. So these episodes, eventually, they will be archived and they're only going to be available to supporters of Cabin of Horrors, whether that be through a subscribe on Twitch or helping through Patreon once we get Patreon set up, that kind of thing. So if you like these episodes, listen to them, enjoy them because they will eventually be gone. Season one will be starting next week and we're going to be revealing a whole brand new series on the cabin of horrors next week so make sure you tune in tap the follow or subscribe button wherever you're listening to this episode that way you'll always know once a new episode is coming out and i was wondering if this episode of the podcast would be a cursed episode similar to our friday the 13th episode that we recorded a couple of months back i believe i think it was in may or june that we recorded that episode This is our 13th episode, and the number 13 is considered an unlucky number in some countries. And there's reasons for that, but really it seems that it's mostly in Western culture that the number 13 is considered to be unlucky. The end of the Mayan calendar's 13th bakhtun was superstitiously feared as a harbinger of the apocalyptic 2012 phenomenon, right? That the end of the world was going to come in 2012. And fear of the number 13 has a specifically recognized phobia. And it's a word that I am not even going to try and attempt to say on this podcast podcast but if you want to see what it is look it up i'm not even going to attempt to say what the word is and the word was first recorded in 1911 the superstitious sufferers of this phobia we're just going to call it the phobia because i'm not saying this word they try to avoid bad luck by keeping away from anything numbered or labeled 13 so as a result of this many companies manufacturers use another way of numbering or labeling different things to avoid the number 13 For example, hotels and tall buildings conspicuously don't have a 13th floor, right? Technically, they do, right? Like, if you were to count the floors, number 14 is (laughs) the 13th floor. Like, you can't avoid having a 13th floor if you're going above 12 floors. But if you're in an elevator, the quote-unquote 13th floor is called the 14th floor, right? Because it's considered so unlucky. It's also considered unlucky to have 13 guests at a table. And Friday the 13th has been considered, well, an unlucky day. And the reason why Friday the 13th was considered an unlucky day, and I was actually educated this by one of my buddies, Scareborn, is that on Friday the 13th of October in 1307, King Philip the fourth of France ordered the arrest of the Knights Templar and most of the Knights were tortured and killed on that day. So that's actually where the Friday, the 13th unluckiness comes from. There's a number of theories as to why, like specifically the number 13 itself became associated with bad luck, but none of them have really been accepted as likely. If you're religious and into Christianity at Jesus Christ's last supper, it said that there were 13 people around the table counting Christ in the 12 apostles. Some believe this is unlucky because one of those 13, was Judas, who was the betrayer of Jesus Christ. So from the 1890s, a number of English language sources related the unlucky 13 to an idea of that at the Last Supper. Judas, being the disciple who betrayed Jesus, was the 13th to sit at the table. So that's really where it comes from in terms of Christianity and religious side of things. There's also a connection to full moons. A year with 13 full moons instead of 12 posed problems for the monks in charge of calendars. This was considered a very unfortunate circumstance, especially by the monks who had charge of the calendar 
calendar of 13 months for that year. And it upset the you know arrangement of church festivals. And for this reason, 13 also became considered to be an unlucky number. So there's many different theories and many different reasons as to why 13 as a number became unlucky. But for me, 13 is actually my favorite number. <laughs> That's my good luck number, to be honest with you. Number 13 is a great number for me. I love the number 13. And it's proved nothing but good luck for me. So I'm not on the bad luck train of the number 13. I actually think it's pretty good luck. And speaking of good luck, horror news in the past week has been pretty freaking good, if you ask me. <laughs> for a prime example, we got the Halloween Ends trailer, guys. <laughs> Last week's podcast, I was talking about Jamie Lee Curtis's tweet and how it could have been that she was teasing a trailer. We may be getting a trailer. Well, guess what? We fucking got one. We got the Halloween Ends trailer and it is exactly, exactly what we were hoping for. The trailer is really a quick montage of scenes that culminates the long-promised battle between Michael and Lori, and it ends with Michael trying to shove Lori's hand into a garbage disposal. So we know, based on these scenes, there's going to be a pretty epic final showdown between Lori Strode and Michael Myers, and I am fucking here for it. <laughs> <laughs> and the trailer itself was absolutely awesome. I totally fanboyed out. I've seen the trailer probably a good 25 to 30 times now. It's just, it's a good time. I'm excited for Halloween Ends. It's going to be a great movie. I know that Laurie Strode most likely will die. Like, really, there has to be an end to her character, but it has to be rewarding right? It has to be rewarding for horror audiences that have literally followed Laurie Strode since 1978 all the way to now because she died in Halloween Resurrection, right? Like they, they killed the Laurie Strode character in Halloween Resurrection and they did her no fucking justice. Like none. She was a mental patient that tried to escape and then tried to show some sympathy for Michael and then gets killed. No, no, they fucked up her death in Halloween Resurrection. So I hope they do a good job and really give her character justice in the end of Halloween Ends. I really do. And alongside that, we actually got a surprise trailer that was released. I, at least I didn't know that this was going to come out. But on the same day, we also got a trailer for Jeepers Creepers Reborn. The next entry, well, I think it's actually a reboot of the Jeepers Creepers franchise. And from what I understand, it's only going to be aired in select theaters for a weekend. So this is going to be a cult following film, I think. I, I think they're making trying to make Jeepers Creepers a very low kind of indie cult classic film that people just talk about but they're not able to see yet kind of thing right to build the hype and get people really excited for jeepers creepers again i think that's what they're trying to do with this and they may be successful it may work for them it's worked for many horror movies in the past right like halloween friday the 13th texas chainsaw massacre like that kind of marketing has worked in the past, so we'll see if it pans out well. The trailer looks good. It looks like they're doing a bit of a different take from the other Jeepers Creepers movies, but I'm in for it. It looks pretty good. We didn't get to see what the Creeper looked like, but I'm hoping that they do him justice as well. And we also got news on the upcoming Monsters movie by Rob Zombie. Not only did he do a Facebook post bitching about the budget, well, not bitching about the budget, I should say. A lot of fans were saying how the Monsters had like a $50 million budget, and Rob Zombie came back out and said, fuck no. <laughs> like, how the fuck do you think this movie got $50 million budget? And he like named a whole bunch of movies he's done, and he's like, if you add them together, that doesn't even equal a $50 million budget. So those ideas are preposterous kind of thing. But we've got actual good news for the Monsters on where it's going to be coming. It's actually going to be releasing on Netflix. It's going to be a Netflix exclusive movie that's going to be releasing in September, which is super exciting because it's going to be released on one of the biggest streaming services, which is going to get more eyes on the Monsters brand. And not many people know the Monsters, especially this generation, right? The Monsters was my parents' generation. I still know it. I watched the Monsters when I was a kid, but this generation coming up probably doesn't know about the monsters except if they saw them in a meme so i like the idea of having more eyes on the monsters a new generation of people get to experience that gothic macabre horror that really we all got to experience when we were kids so i think netflix is a great idea and we also got a tease as well from a24 mia goth who will reprise the role of x's villain pearl in an upcoming prequel movie titled pearl <laughs> is now featured in a new poster for the upcoming prequel movie. And not only that, but the trailer 
is going to be coming online. So for no one who has seen the trailer to Pearl, that was, I believe, at the end of X, it's now going to be released online this week, which is super exciting. The prequel movie is set in 1918, decades prior to the 1970s set X, which was released in theaters back in March of this year. And Goth played the dual role of Pearl, a senior citizen, and Maxine, the film's final girl. And the film ends with Maxine killing Pearl, who, along with her husband Howard, had been brutally slain Maxine's friends throughout the movie. And Ty West had indicated earlier this year that the world of X may eventually even expand to include a third movie, but there's no official confirmation of that yet, but I really hope that we get some sort of universe coming from X, because from what I'm hearing about X, I haven't seen it yet, unfortunately, but when I do, I'm going to review it on this podcast because X looks absolutely awesome. I am really excited to watch it. So on this week's episode of the podcast, we are ending a trilogy of episodes, Because we are going to go over the final film in the Saw trilogy, Saw 3, which is by far the most emotional Saw movie and definitely one of the Saw movies that you will look at completely different once you have seen every single movie in the series. If you come back to it after watching Saw 7, you immediately see it in a whole other light and it's so much more emotional and raw than when you first watched it. Because when you first see Saw 3, all you see is the gore, right? Because they took the gore porn to a whole whole new fucking level when it came to Saw 3. But when you really watch the movie and dig deep into the tones and the underlying message of the movie, it is a fucking emotional roller coaster of a time, not just gore porn. I love Saw 3. It's my second favorite movie in the franchise. And like I said, it hits different after you've seen all the Saw movies. Because when you find out shit that's going on that you don't know about and then you go back to that movie, you're like, damn, son. Damn. (laughs) And I will give a warning for all the Saw fans that are coming in to watch this podcast just to hear what my thoughts are. I am Team Amanda. (laughs) Justice for Amanda. And And I will not explain in this episode why because I do not want to give spoilers. But once we go through all of the Saw movies throughout our episodes here at the Cabin of Horrors podcast, I will eventually explain why. I am a Justice for Amanda kind of person and I am all about Amanda Young. (laughs) And Saw 3 saw the return of Darren Lynn Bozeman coming to the franchise to direct another screenplay, which was based off the story created by Lee Wannell and James Wan. The story of the film surrounds a man named Jeff Denlin, whose son was struck by a drunk driver and is now being subjected to Jigsaw's tests. The point of his tests is to overcome the anger towards his son's killer. While this trap is being played out, though, John Kramer's dying, right? John Kramer is literally holding on by an inch of threat of his life and his apprentice Amanda Young kidnaps a nurse to try to keep him alive for the final test that Jeff Denlin's going through. And due to the successful opening weekend of the second film in the franchise, Saw 2, a third film was immediately given the green light, right? Like, if there's dollar signs surrounding a horror movie, you can guarantee there will be a sequel, unless it's a Jordan Peele movie, because, man, Jordan Peele doesn't do sequels. And I love that. (laughs) I just want to say that. I love that. Jordan Peele doesn't do sequels. It doesn't matter how much the movie made. He don't do sequels, so... He's an exception to the rule. The team of Bowsman, Wannell, and Juan originally turned down the offer of making a third film in the Saw franchise. However, it was a few weeks before the release of Saw 2 that producer Greg Hoffman passed away. And while the trio was having lunch the day they heard of Hoffman's passing, they decided at that point to make Saw 3 in his name. So while they were developing the story of the film, Wannell wanted to make it more emotional than other entries in the franchise. He described the plot as a father-daughter love story between Jigsaw and Amanda Young. And because of this, Saw 3 is, like I said, one of the only movies in the franchise that just hits different after you end up watching all of the movies in the franchise. When you watch Saw 3 for the first time, you see one perspective of the story. However, as you watch later installments, you begin to learn that a lot more happens behind the scenes of Saw 3 than you realized. I highly recommend anyone to return to Saw 3 after you finish the franchise, because seriously, you'll see it with a brand new set of eyes. And the trio who gave us the second Saw film had originally wanted to get Carrie Elwes to return as Dr. Lawrence Gordon, who was the protagonist of the first Saw film in the franchise. The story would have seen Gordon being forced back into Jigsaw's game once again to save his wife, and it would have culminated with him murdering Jigsaw and Amanda, which would conclude the series trilogy. 
Unfortunately, as we know, they couldn't get Cary Elwes to reprise his role, but casting still went underway. The team had completed developing the story of Saw 3, and the lead role of Lynn was given to Bahar Sumek, who was appearing in the 2004 Lionsgate film Crash. Though she had nightmares for the first month she was on set for this movie, the role was a real challenge for her because she wasn't a fan of horror films, and she hadn't seen any previous entries in the Saw franchise, so it was a real challenge for her to get in the role and understand exactly how to portray this character. And Angus McFadden was cast as Jeff after he read the script and was a fan of horror films, including Saw, so he was a shoe-in. Costas Maitalor was casted in the role of Mark Hoffman because he was asked if he wanted to come up and have some fun on the film for a week. He was actually friends with some of the filmmakers, so they just brought him on and said, hey, you want to have fun with us for a week? (laughs) Great way to get a job and a permanent uh, entry in the franchise. Monica Potter was also approached to reprise her role as Dr. Gordon's wife from the first film, but she declined their offer because she didn't really have an interest in coming back to the Saw movies. She felt she did as much as she could in that role, apparently. So, okay. (laughs) Uh, Production of Saw 3 was provided a much larger budget due to the success of the previous installments of the film. Saw 3 got $10 million to be developed compared to the $4 million budget of Saw 2. Principal photography commenced for 27 days at the Cinespace Film Studios in Toronto during 2006. And funny enough, the bathroom set that they used in Scary Movie 4, which was parodying the Saw franchise in that movie, was used during the production of Saw 3. (laughs) And many of the transitions that we see in the film were also shot on the spot instead of utilizing digital effects. For example, the scene where the camera pans from Troy's crime scene to Carrie being in the bathtub, that was all shot on the spot. So Dana Meyer actually had to run, take off all of her clothes, then jump into the bathtub to make that shot. It wasn't special effects. It wasn't anything digital. It was shot one after another, which is a testament in filmmaking and how this film was able to kind of break stereotypical norms of using CGI for slashings, using CGI for all kinds of cool looking effects to trick the viewer. No, none of that. It's all just practical. And that's what I love the most about the Saw movies. Some of the traps in Saw 3 also proved to be quite challenging, such as the pig scene, because it had so many moving parts. The pig carcasses were actually made of foam, rubber, and latex with live disinfected maggots attached to them with honey. How gross is that? (laughs) And this was falling on that dude. So like, gross. (laughs) Gross. <laughs> and the rack trap was originally conceived as a trap that would fold a person into a box, which would have been really cool to see, but I can imagine also a logistical nightmare when it comes to filming and post production. So, this may have been why they decided to switch the concept to twisting of body parts instead for that trap. Bowsman also wanted to have a trap that showed someone freezing to death, since the previous films had someone burn to death, bleed to death, and be dismembered. A body cast was made for the actress who was involved in the freezer trap scene, though only a front or back body cast could be on the actress at any given time. This is because of safety regulations. A person cannot be entombed, (laughs) right? A living person cannot be entombed, and that would be entombing them. And the classroom trap at the beginning of the movie originally called for the character to be hanging from the ceiling by meat hooks, though this was decided against because the logic of not being able to rip your chains out, you know, It would have broken the whole logic of Jigsaw's trap. So they ended up switching it up so that it was more logical and something that logically the person could escape from and survive. And the movie was released on October 27th, 2006. And it was toned down a total of seven times to obtain an R rating. (laughs) Five people had been reported to faint at separate cinemas during the screenings of Saw 3 in the UK, which resulted in ambulances being called. So yeah, this movie definitely upped the ante when it came to gore porn, for sure. But the story and message behind it is one of the most powerful and emotional in any of the Saw movies. And a lot of people agreed, because the movie opened at number one on 4,700 screens in 3,167 theaters, which grossed $33.6 million from its opening weekend alone. And this was an increase from Saw 2, which only made $31.7 million during opening weekend. And Saw 3 took home a total of $80.2 million between the U.S. and Canada, and an additional $84.6 million in other areas. This gave them a total worldwide gross of $164.8 million. For a horror movie, a quote-unquote gore porn movie, made $164.8 million worldwide. 
fuck anybody who says that these movies suck. Like, people love them. They make fucking bank. Like, you know what I mean? And we're still talking about them to this day. So anyone who bashed the Saw movies when they came out can suck it. (laughs) This entry of the franchise as well holds the record for the highest grossing weekend of the series across the board. And it's the highest grossing film out of all the Saw movies worldwide. Saw 3 made the most money out of any Saw movie. And it's really no surprise, though, that the third installment turned out to be the most profitable of them all. Because when the first Saw movie came out, it was a low-budget indie horror movie, right? Obviously, nobody knew about it. Obviously, nobody gave it the time of day when it first came out until the word of mouth spread about Saw. Once a film really gets typecasted like that in the low-budget indie horror realm... It limits the amount of exposure it's going to receive unless it spreads through word of mouth, right? Which it did. This was the case with the first entry of the Saw franchise. It really spread through word of mouth. Similar to what movies of the heyday of horror did, you know, in the 70s and 80s, Halloween, Last House on the Left, Friday the 13th. These movies only became popular because people talk so much about them. Like, I remember when the first movie came out and there were a few rumblings about it, enough to enough to spark curiosity in others to watch the film. Others ended up seeing it because they were dared to at a young age because of all the violence and torture depicted in the first Saw. So they were kind of like, ooh, it's one of those Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies. I dare you to see it, right? Kind of that deal. Though it was this that boosted the popularity of the first Saw film and brought those people back out for the second movie. Though it wasn't until that moment that the franchise started to pick up. Once the sequel was released, everybody knew about Saw at that point. It became one of those movies you had to see because of all the gore, the torture porn that wasn't seen much in theatrical horror releases at that time. And not only that, but the twist endings, the way that they misled the audience on what was actually going on throughout the movie, right? There's a lot of moving parts that go into making an effective Saw movie. So when the third entry of the Saw franchise was released, it's a no-brainer that everyone just had to see it, right? At that point, it, and that's what made it the highest grossing film of the franchise. Not only this, but society at the time was bred on the idea of quote-unquote trilogy movies. These are films where the story unfolds over the course of three separate films, though generally there's some sort of definitive ending to the story. Because of this, many people probably believe that this movie, Saw 3, would be the final entry into the Saw franchise, and they wanted to see how it ends. Would Jigsaw die? Does Amanda continue in his footsteps? So many questions needed to be answered, which equals big money for the film's bottom line. And that's really what brought the majority of people out. They wanted to see how it was going to end. Not that we were told it was going to end, but we're so bred on trilogies that it ends with a trilogy, right? So that brought everybody back out. All right, guys. So now we're going to head into the plot of the movie. We're going to talk about exactly what happens in Saw 3. So this is going to be full of spoilers. If you have not seen Saw 3 and you want to and you don't want to be spoiled, this is the time to stop that epi- the episode of the podcast. Go watch it. Come back and listen to the rest and hear the rest of my thoughts on the movie. <laughs> So the movie starts off from the end of the second film, where we see Detective Eric Matthews, who was chained to the bathtub and left to die. He grabs a toilet lid and begins to smash his foot to pieces so he can escape the shackle that's around his ankle. After doing so, he begins to crawl out of the bathroom, screaming for Amanda, as the story fast forwards six months later to his team from the second film, all those cops and SWAT teams that were with him in the, uh, the warehouse of the second movie. And now we're shown a brand new game that was played out after it was discovered by Officer Daniel Riggs' SWAT team. We're shown the victim, Troy, being chained to the room 
through different places on his body. And in order to escape, he has to rip his flesh from the chains before the timer runs out, and a bomb is then detonated. During their investigation of the scene, we see Jigsaw's MO broken for the first time. It's discovered that the exit door for the room was actually welded shut, which would have prevented the victim from surviving the trap. Detective Carey goes back to the police station so she can review the videotapes left at the crime scene when she's knocked out and abducted. She then wakes up, finds herself in a room hanging from a harness that's hooked into her ribs. In order to survive, she's going to need to retrieve a key which lies at the bottom of a beaker that is filled with acid. Ouch! <laughs> so she lunges her hand into the acid and ends up retrieving the key in time to open the trap. However, this doesn't prevent her death as the trap inevitably kills her. But not before she sees the person who placed her into the trap. We don't get to see them, but she saw the person who placed her into the trap before it opens up her rib cage and guts go flying. <laughs> the story then pans over to a man and woman who appear to be in an argument over their relationship. The woman is Dr. Lynn Denlin, and she leaves to an emergency call at the hospital where she works, and that's when she's abducted and brought to a bed-ridden John Kramer. And this is really where we see John Kramer weak for the first time. Like, in the second Saw movie, we saw him connected to IV. He looked frail. He did look a little bit weak, but he didn't look weak enough to not be a convincing killer. But seeing him bedridden like this makes him a weak killer. But at the same point, you're still absolutely terrified of him. When the camera pans, like when they're they're wheeling in Dr. Lynn Denlin, they're wheeling her into the room and Jigsaw's lying on the bed and that camera, the way it pans to him and he takes off the oxygen mask, it's terrifying. Despite this man being literally on his last thread of life, it's still terrifying to see him in that state. And Dr. Lynn Denlin at the same time, she's strapped with a collar trap that was created by Amanda Young, which is armed with five shotgun shells directed towards her head. And in order for the doctor to survive the trap, she needs to keep John alive enough until the current game is played out. The collar trap that's around Lynn's neck is connected to John's heart rate monitor, which will cause the device to engage should he die or if Lynn goes out of range. So there's another game in play now, and John needs to be alive and witness how it plays out. The victim of this game is Jeff, who's a grief-stricken father who is consumed by vengeance after his young son was killed by a drunk driver. The tests Jeff must undergo all surround his vengeance towards the person who murdered his son. The first test brings him to a meat freezer where he finds a woman chained from the ceiling and has been completely stripped naked. Jeff realizes the woman is Danica Scott, who was the only witness to his son's murder, though she had refused to testify in court. So the room begins spraying Danica's naked body with ice cold water. She's crying out for help and Jeff is super reluctant to help her, right? He's continued to be consumed by the vengeance for his son. And after she eventually persuades him to help her, Jeff attempts to retrieve the key, but he's too late and Danica freezes to death. So he proceeds on to his next test where he finds Judge Halden, who was the one that presided during the trial of his son's death. And he ended up giving the drunk driver a less than harsh sentence. This gives Jeff ample opportunity to unleash the vengeance he wanted to on the man who could have put away the man who killed his son for a long time. Judge Halden is chained by the neck to the bottom of a vat where rotting pig carcasses are being dropped into a grinder with their juices slowly filling up the pit. Jeff has the choice to save the judge should he choose. However, in order to do so, he has to burn all of his son's toys and memorabilia in an incinerator so he can then retrieve the key which will free the judge. So after an emotional scene, Jeff makes the move to burn the memories of his son and retrieves the key, which then frees the judge. So he gets the judge out safely. Meanwhile, Lynn is being forced to perform surgeries on a near-dead John Kramer while Amanda Young holds her at gunpoint. <laughs> so this is where we, we go back and forth between the game and the absolute gore fest that is happening over here on the left side with fucking Jigsaw, Amanda, and Lynn. And the intensity and sense of urgency in these scenes are some of the best moments that we get in Saw 3. It's these instances that create the tension we've come to know of the franchise. And it really creates a very suspenseful tone throughout the movie like will john die is this all part of a game and he's actually going to live there's so many questions that spawn in your head the first time you watch these scenes and they did a great job of executing them and then we end up going back to jeff's game we see he has reached what is believed to be his final test when he enters the room he finds timothy young the drunk driver who had murdered his son in the horrific accident and timothy strapped to a machine which is designed to twist his limbs and head until they come right off 
Amazingly designed trap, by the way. And just like the other traps that Jeff had to face throughout his game, he has the chance to fight against his feelings of vengeance and save Timothy from the fate in front of him. But to do so, Jeff will have to remove a key which is tied to the trigger of an enclosed shotgun. <laughs> it's never fucking easy. <laughs> There's always a risk. So Jeff decides to be the bigger man and goes to retrieve the key off the shotgun. However, when Jeff goes to retrieve it, the shotgun goes off, which ends up killing Judge Halden. The key's not retrieved in time, and Jeff is left to watch the limbs and head of Timothy turn inside out as the machine snaps his neck. Then we go back to the intense surgery of John Kramer. <laughs> Lynn has continued to be forced to provide improv surgeries to relieve the pressure on John's brain. This includes utilizing a power drill to remove a piece of his skull and alleviate the pressure. During this time, Amanda finds a note which is not shown to the audience. This is very important. For anybody who's watching the Saw series and you want to see all of the nuances, the scene where Amanda finds the note that is not shown to the audience. We have no idea what is on that note. I want you to remember that piece of fucking information and watch all the rest of the Saw movies. <laughs> because it's at this moment, that moment that will come back to haunt us in Saw entries to come. But when she finds the note, her demeanor immediately changes to one of jealousy towards Lynn. Once the surgery was complete and shown to be successful, Lynn is actually able to convince John to let her leave. And Amanda's ordered by John to remove the collar that's around Lynn's neck. However, Amanda refuses in a complete fit of rage and jealousy towards John and how he has treated Lynn throughout the game. Amanda threatens Lynn's life while John pleads with Amanda to remember the rules of the game. He reveals that he knows Amanda no longer believes in the jigsaw philosophy and had been manipulating her traps to prevent those from escaping. And despite John's warnings to Amanda to put down the gun, she ends up shooting Lynn just as Jeff arrives into the room from completing his traps. This is where we get the infamous plot twists <laughs> that the Saw movies are so well known for. We find out that Jeff is actually Lynn's husband. So at the beginning of the movie, she was having an affair. <laughs> and that was a complete swerve to the audience because we find out Jeff is Lynn's husband, which is why her survival was so important for Amanda's life. Because now that her husband witnessed his wife being shot, Jeff immediately retaliates by shooting Amanda. And as she's bleeding out, she puts her view onto John, who reveals that Lynn was not the one being tested. She was. The acts that Amanda committed went against the philosophy of Jigsaw, and he could not allow a murderer to continue his legacy. Which is so sad. I'm not going to say why. God, I cannot wait to get further into this series. And then we're going to have literally an entire episode, guys. Once I, once I review all seven Saw movies, we are going to have an episode at the end of it that is all on Amanda Young. <laughs> and all on the story of Amanda Young. Because I truly believe the story of Amanda Young from start to finish is one of the greatest storylines of the Saw franchise. Love the character. Love the story. Anyways... Continuing, so Jigsaw turns his attention back towards Jeff and offers to call an ambulance for Lynn if he can prove he has learned how to conquer his vengeance. So John presents Jeff with one final test, either kill John or forgive him for what he's done to him and his wife. So Jeff leans down towards Jigsaw's bedridden body and says the words, I forgive you. As he picks up a fucking power saw and slashes the throat of John Kramer. <laughs> However, vengeance has now consumed jeff he lost the test once again so because he killed jigsaw this now leaves lynn with the activated collar strap to her neck sorry jeff the shotgun shells blow off lynn's head as the room they're in is sealed shut before john dies he takes out one last tape recorder which informs jeff he's lost more than his wife Corbett, his daughter, is also captured and being held captive somewhere and in order to save her he must face one last test this signals that there are more apprentices out there and the games have only just begun. Now, this movie hits different after you've seen the rest of the franchise movies. Am I right, Saw fans? Like, it really does. There's a lot of lore and story as to what actually happened in this movie that is played out in future installments. Now, like I said, I'm not going to spoil anything for those who haven't seen it, but there's much more to come when we're looking at Amanda Young. That's all I'm going to say. And not only did this movie begin to open up lore for the franchise, it truly is one of the most underrated entries of the franchise. Many of the previous and future installments of the franchise don't really give much in the way of character development. Not a gripe for me, though, because really, character development in horror movies can be borderline faux pas. <laughs> though Saw 3 really takes it to a new level when it comes to the characters of John Kramer and Amanda Young. Both of these characters are obviously troubled. 
John is a cancer-ridden patient who is reeling from events that happened in his life, while Amanda is a former drug addict and self-harmer. The film even dives deep into these troubles, especially when it comes to Amanda Young. The filmmakers don't shy away from, from showing the grim scenes of heroin use, cutting, and other murderous tendencies. But while on the surface, this, this can be looked at by some as a way of providing shock value to the audience, right? But I don't believe that that's the case with this film. These scenes showed the layers of Amanda Young and provided insight into the pain and struggles she faces on a daily basis. Then you have John Kramer who doesn't stare at Amanda's drug track marks or the cuts on her arm, nor does he berate her for being unappreciative with her life. Instead, he offers her the ultimate act of love and gives her a second chance at life by being a part of his world as his apprentice. This immediately humanizes the character of Jigsaw and John Kramer. Now he's become somewhat of a surrogate father figure to Amanda and teaches her the ways and worldviews like no other father would for his daughter. And during this process, John begins to understand that the two of them are more alike than either of them realize. Two people that were cast aside by the world and regulated to the shadows. John pulled Amanda out and said, I see you and accept you, your flaws and all. And to really appreciate Saw 3 for what it is, you need to look past the violence in front of you and see the emotional core of the film that can be seen from Amanda Young. Think about it, all right? After years of drug addiction, being lonely, and experiencing deep emotional pain, she finally gets the one thing she has always wanted, which was to be seen, to be understood, and for someone to tell her, yes, you've been through a rough life, but there's a reason for it, and I'm here to help you. Regardless of the how, considering it's a twisted world of kidnapping, traps, and life-or-death choices that John brings Amanda into, it still creates that emotional connection between these two characters, which is the core of Saw 3. It gives the audience a genuine reason to care not only about John, but Amanda during the course of the film. And Saw 3 really has some of the most horrific traps and moments in the franchise, like whether it's Troy having to rip chains secured to his skin, or Detective Carrie having her rib cage torn apart, it's all par for the course when it comes to the Saw franchise. However, these horrific moments are what hide the smaller scenes, which deepen John and Amanda as characters. It's simple to just throw this movie into the gore porn category and sweep it under the rug without much attention, though these are just spectacles which serve to heighten the mental state of John Kramer and Amanda Young. For example, the graphic scene where Lynn is doing brain surgery on John. Amanda is watching all of this unfold with front row seats. Instead of only focusing on the sheer brutality of the brain surgery, we see a moment where Amanda clasps John's hand and reassures him that everything will be okay. And John responds by removing Amanda's doubts surrounding her ability to carry on the Jigsaw legacy, telling her that she can and that she's stronger now and he believes in her. These are the smaller moments you can find within these brutal scenes that truly heighten both characters to their emotional peaks. And in this scene, we're not witnessing two murderous villains plotting death and destruction. We see two human beings laying their hearts and insecurities bare for all to witness. John is lying on his deathbed, and we get to see just how deeply afraid Amanda is at the possibility of losing the one person in her life who actually understands and accepts her for who she is. And John doesn't see her as a drug addict or someone destined for failure. He sees someone who deserves to be loved. And you may not agree with the Jigsaw philosophy or Amanda's murderous tendencies through the film, but through the film, it still gives us reasons to care about these two people. Just like John sees Amanda for who she really is, we as the audience are able to do the same and begin to understand some of the rationale behind each of their actions. And the filmmakers did a really good job at making us forget that these two are the film's primary antagonists. <laughs> like, these moments make you feel for the characters, despite the fact we really shouldn't. <laughs> at the end of the day, it's that understanding we have of universal struggles like John's loss and grief, as well as Amanda's addiction and not fitting into society. The film does something truly admirable by getting us to empathize with these two characters. By doing this, it solidifies their character development as the backbone for Saw 3. And had the filmmakers decided to forego developing John and Amanda, instead giving us, you know, cheesy dialogue and film motivations, the tension caused by their pain and grief would be empty, and it would eliminate any reason for us to care about what happens to them, especially in those final moments of the film. It's hard, though, not to stare transfixed at the zany and complex traps that we get to witness in Saw 3. Though as lavish as these traps may be, the emotion isn't found in the traps themselves or the people within them. It's how each of these moments impact John and Amanda. The moment where John rejects Amanda and says, we don't need you, it provides a shocking climax when you see the look of pure horror and childlike sadness cross on Amanda's face. Having her mentor turn father figure choose someone else besides her during his time of need can be like a dagger to the heart. 
And in some ways, Amanda's entire world collapsed with those few words. And she has no family or meaningful relationships that we know of outside of John. So on top of that, she's also watching him die. This causes her to relapse and then become completely distraught. And then she starts rejecting Jigsaw's past assurances to her. The entire film is leading up to this penultimate moment when Amanda finally lets her insecurities get the best of her. The entire plot of Saw 3 relies on the emotional roller coaster between John and Amanda. And we feel Amanda's pain, but at the same time understand John's trepidation. Saw 3 is true proof that horror genre gore porn movies can have its tension heightened while still giving us well-developed characters that the audience can relate to and empathize with. I hope you guys really